Hey guys, Mr. David here once again. Uh, this is a pretty monumental day actually for us as today we finish the content that's going to be covered on this year's AP exam. Now, I have to be honest, that wasn't the initial plan. After this, we were supposed to talk about the Cold War and the Civil Rights Movement and politics and society throughout the later part of the 20th into the 21st century. Uh, but because of the pandemic and because of the change in school schedule brought about by COVID-19, uh, this is where AP has determined we are going to stop. So with that being said, after today's lesson, we're going to be done with what we need to cover for the AP exam. So into the spring break that starts next week and um, into the later part of April, we will focus on what we need to do to make sure we're as prepared as possible for this modified AP exam. So a lot of interesting stuff going on today with the United States and World War II. My focus is to primarily talk about the United States on the home front and the changes uh, that the country will undergo, but this is a war. We do still want to talk about some of the major developments that happened during the wartime, uh, so we'll spend some time doing that as well. A lot of pictures, a lot of interesting content and information, so I hope you're looking forward to it as much as I am. So I want to take you right to the end of 1941 and the Japanese surprise attack on Pearl Harbor, the day that will live in infamy, as FDR will famously say, as war is declared on Japan the next day. For a lot of Americans, the attack on Pearl Harbor meant a lot of resentment towards Japan. And this feeling by a lot of Americans is, hey, we need to go to Japan first. That should be our focus here when it comes to the wartime. They're the ones that attacked us. That needs to be our priority. Well, what instead is going to happen is the government's going to be seeing this in a little bit of a different way. And they come up with an agreement known as ABC1 with Britain. And this agreement agreed to the United States going with Britain to go over to Germany and Europe first, okay? And this was the idea here. Japan, although important, they could wait, all right? And really, there was an urgency of going over to Europe. Remember, at this point, the German war machine is attacking Britain. They are going after the Soviet Union. If they were to beat both of them, this would be incredibly problematic, and this would be horrific for the future of humanity. So this is the idea here. Move all over Europe. We'll get over to Japan, Asia kind of later. Now, just so everyone realizes this, the United States will be fighting in Japan for the entirety of the war when they enter. It just means that their priority is going to be on Europe. And actually in World War II, about 80-85% of all American forces see action in Europe and the remaining 15-ish percent see action in Asia. So that really shows you the U.S.'s priorities. Much bigger deal that they have to go after. So when we talk about World War One, we talked about a total war. World War Two, especially for the United States, is even more so of a total war. So just so we recall and kind of remind ourselves, the United States isn't in terrible shape when it comes to their involvement in World War Two because they had already done a couple things to prepare for the wartime. Uh, not enough by any stretch, but at the same time, the fact that they instituted a peacetime draft in 1940 meant that they at least had men trained and ready to go much more quickly than they did in World War One. We also have cash and carry, lend-lease that had gotten the factories going, but because of the degree of total war that World War Two is going to require... Once the U.S. gets involved, it's going to be way more than World War I. What do we need specifically? We need total production. The economy needs to be working at epic levels, levels that really haven't been seen before. Why is that the case? Well, of course, we need food, we need armor, we need weapons. And it's not just for the United States. We need food and arms and ammunition, all that kind of things for the allies who are desperately relying on the U.S.'s 
aid and assistance. We also need this to be much more coordinated because uh, we're looking at a war that's being fought on two different theaters. Okay, we're talking about a war that's happening in Europe, and we're also talking about a war that's happening in Asia. And this map reminds us of how far Germany had gotten up to 1941, basically Britain alone and then the Soviet Union there under attack in the later part of 1941. In order to make this happen, the United States is going to need even more government involvement than they had previous, and so we're going to see that absolutely occur as we go through this. We also are going to need public support, and that's going to take definitely the form of propaganda. But to be honest, World War II, for most Americans, will be relatively popular. So not necessarily the degree of propaganda that's going to be necessary as in World War I, where the government was really trying to change people's minds um, about involvement because there was so much um, kind of resentment and so much really non-public support. Okay, a look again at our map in Europe. This is a look at our map in Asia, and we'll talk about this a little bit more, but uh, Japan had also had a lot of success in the early part of the wartime as well. I want to share with you some World War II propaganda. You'll notice some similar themes as the World War I propaganda. I really like this one. U.S. resentment towards Hitler was very, very high, so something like this would have been incredibly effective. This one's an interesting one, trying to get people to enlist into the Navy. Uh, if I were a man, I'd join as this uh, young lady. So trying to put some pressure here on uh, young men. Okay, this one's very interesting. The young child with the uh, Third Reich hat and buy war bonds before it is too late. Here's another one. Okay, we're going to buy war bonds or else this is what's going to happen in the home. To be honest, most of the enemy portrayal will be on Germany, but you can see here definitely some on the Japanese. This, by the way, is a look at woman, and we're going to talk more specifically about woman. It's Rosie the Riveter. Rosie the Riveter during World War II is a call for women to get involved in the war, and afterwards becomes kind of this feeling of woman and female empowerment. And here's another one, and this one talks specifically about rationing, and I'm going to talk about rationing a little bit more. If you remember, in World War I, rationing was something that was highly encouraged, but not necessarily required. In World War II, rationing will actually be a requirement uh, by the government in order to save supplies, but not super dramatic, um, but definitely a different feeling in people's lives. Probably one of the most stinging and negative legacies of World War II in the United States, and one of the ultimate failures of FDR's presidency will be what happens with Japanese Americans um, during the wartime. So, if you recall, U.S. immigration had been severely limited during the 1920s and 1930s. Um, this had to do with the fact of the 1920s, they had those quotas and they put restrictions. And then in the 1930s, even more so because of the lack of jobs due to the Great Depression. So because of that, when we're fighting the war, the U.S. government is going to be not as suspicious or skeptical of minority groups because most immigrant groups had been settled for quite some period of time. Uh, they weren't fresh immigrants. They didn't really feel like these people had these tying loyalties uh, back home. So this especially is our case for our Germans and our Italians, who, for the most part, had been in the United States for a long time. The exception to this relative acceptance of immigrant and minority groups will be for the Japanese living in the United States. About 120,000 Japanese living in the United States, mostly centered on the Pacific in California, uh, but also some in like the Oregon, Washington area. And about two-thirds of these people, by the way, were U.S. citizens. So they had actually been born in the country. Great fear by the U.S. early on in the war of an invasion by the Japanese. And there was a fear that if that happened 
that Japanese Americans, even if they were U.S. citizens, would be looking to assist the Japanese um, in this invasion, as well as a fear of overall sabotage uh, towards the war effort, and they might hinder the U.S.'s ability to fight the war because of some allegiance or some loyalty to Japan. Because of this fear, early in 1942, President FDR will sign Executive Order 9066, and this is what will establish Japanese internment, forcing people of Japanese ancestry to go to internment camps throughout the country, all right, and forcing them to leave their homes. So this is the reality that will face these Japanese citizens, or uh, most of which will be citizens, as a huge hindrance of human and American rights. These people are taken from their homes. They will go to assembly centers where they will wait. And then once the internment camps are created, they will be sent out into basically the middle of nowhere where they will live amongst each other and have limited to no contact with the outside world. So this is the reality that comes into play for our Japanese um, and, and Japanese Americans in the United States. Now, you might be thinking to yourself, hopefully you should be thinking this at this part in time, this seems horribly unconstitutional. Okay, how can the American government have the right to just take people from their homes? Well, many Japanese Americans agreed. And one in particular, Korematsu, is going to say, I shouldn't have to leave my home. And his case will reach all the way up to the Supreme Court. And remember, the, what the Supreme Court decides is always the final decision, basically. So once his decision goes all the way to the Supreme Court, this is their opportunity to either uphold Japanese internment or to look at it a little more carefully and say, no, no, we can't have this. This is something that is unconstitutional, unwarranted, etc. Supreme Court will say, nope, this is okay, and will uphold the constitutionality of Japanese internment. The major rationale given is basically because of the fact that it's a wartime necessity, everyone has to sacrifice during wartime, and this is the overarching idea that we just can't take any risks. So brutal in uh, by all intents and purposes, but nonetheless what the United States feels is necessary in order to be able to fight this war. You want to realize the impact that this has for these people? Number one, they live in complete isolation. Number two, they lose their property, and when they come back, that property is not going to be waiting for them anymore. They also learn, they also lose potential earnings that they could have received had they been able to work and live in society without being having to live in isolation in these camps. However, after the war ends, the government kind of has them go back doesn't really help them readjust or anything like that. And in the 1980s, there's going to be a congressional commission com put together, uh, again, long after the war is over, to kind of look at whether or not this internment was necessary and whether or not Japanese Americans actually posed a real and serious threat. And what the government is going to say and what this commission is going to say in the 1980s when war is long gone and, you know, there's been time to really think about this and investigate it, is that no, it was completely unnecessary. And instead, it was fueled by war hysteria, racial prejudice, and the failure of political leadership. So, basically, FDR for signing the executive order and then the Supreme Court upholding uh, Japanese internment. And the United States will publicly apologize, something that is rarely ever done, and will also grant the survivors of internment $20,000. Not necessarily close to anything that they would have needed to actually make up what they had lost in, for most of them, three-ish years in internment camps, but a some type of effort, I suppose, to basically admit that the government was panicked by what happened and did something that was incredibly unfair and incredibly unnecessary. Uh, definitely, when we're thinking about World War II, this is a horrible legacy. Uh, definitely, when we're thinking about the U.S. the U.S. 
uh, government and their treatment of minorities, this is something that is just really a painful legacy. And it's also close to home because this stuff happened uh, largely in California. That's where most uh, Japanese Americans lived in the 1940s. This, by the way, was put up all throughout various areas of California and town. And you can see this if you look carefully here. But what it's requiring people to do is to get all their stuff and to come to these um, assembly centers so they can go to the um, camps. This, by the way, is a look at one of the camps. Again, desolate, middle of nowhere. Uh, guarded. Again, they try to maintain some normalcy. They build up these homes or kind of like cabin type things uh, for the internees to live, but this is obviously anything but ideal. These are people boarding up uh, some trains to go to some of the internment camps. And I really like this picture because this shows some young uh, Japanese children who obviously are not involved in this by any stretch, but nonetheless are the victims of racism and war hysteria and are now trapped inside and you see the uh, wire and other things just like basically they're prisoners to make sure no one escapes the upside down triangles are assembly centers these are where people go and they gather in the really you know thousands and thousands and the reason why is because this is where they wait as the internment camps are being constructed basically from scratch. Uh, you see actually Santa Anita was an assembly center, as was the Pomona Fairgrounds. And then once that the internment camps are completed, they're going to send them all over the country. And you'll see uh, the one closest to us and the one that's relatively famous is uh, Manzanar. And actually, you, you can go up to visit Manzanar if you're interested, um, if you ever go up to like Lake Tahoe or the Reno area, you'd actually pass Manzanar on the way. And today there's a little visitor center and things to uh, pay tribute to those that lived um, and, and had to be reallocated to the internment camps. Again, here's another look, Manzanar War Relocation Center. Um, so again, this is where Japanese Americans will live out basically World War II. And here's Korematsu, and Korematsu became kind of a public figure after his case. And this is him looking at kind of the legacies of internment and hoping that governments and others don't judge people as terrorists or some other negative connotation just because of their race or ethnicity or something like that. And so that's really uh, powerful. Um, because we want to always look at what's happened and try to kind of correct our ways to make sure we don't make the same mistakes. If we're looking at something that is impressive and that is a worthy legacy of World War II, we should talk about the strides made in production. In order to facilitate war production, the government creates the War Production Board, the WPB, and this helps make sure the country is ready to build up the weapons, tanks, battleships, machine guns, all the things that are going to be necessary in order to fight a war efficiently, especially a war of this magnitude. The WPB also limits consumer goods, so this makes sure that people are not wasting and, and also, more importantly, that factories are not producing things that would take away from their efforts on the battlefield. So, for example, they're going to limit things like the production of passenger cars. They're going to have people do other types of things to make sure that all the necessary materials are being allocated towards tanks, towards planes, towards armor, and not something else that's not going to be necessary at that point in time. The War Production Board also tells factories what to produce and helps them basically go through the process of changing their operations to make sure they can accommodate the heavy purchase orders basically the government is going to impose on them. Um, so for example, like Jeep, which was a car company, is going to uh, become 
they're going to start to make tanks and other things like that. So the government and the War Production Board will help them basically facilitate that change so they're going to be able to do so. The government's also going to impose rationing. Uh, this is mainly rationing on big staple food like sugar, flour, uh, wheat, other types of things like that, and also ration gas, things that are basically going to have better usage in the wartime for soldiers, for equipment, and other things like that. So this is some of the stuff that that is done in order to really make sure that all efforts are being used in order to facilitate war production. Farmers will also increase their output. Many farmers will have to leave the farms in order to fight and be a soldier, but improved production methods, improved fertilizers, uh, better technological equipment will allow for better output. And the good news for our farmers is that you do have mouths to feed. Um, you do have uh, foreign countries that are interested in purchasing uh, goods from the United States. So it means that now for farmers, they do have the green light to produce in epic levels because there are going to be people that are willing to buy. When we talk about the Great Depression, we talk about uh, unemployment problems. It's World War II and World War II production that will lead to basically full employment in the economy. And the unemployment level will reach such lows, it basically is like unemployment didn't exist. Because there are jobs for people in the military, there's jobs for people in the factories and productions. Uh, this is a really, really big, big time. And so when we talk about the economy, we talk about production, we say it's rocking. Logo of the War Production Board here. Here's an interesting one uh, for War Production Board. Every time you twist a nut, think of Hitler. Again, powerful. Uh, here's another idea here. Their lives are in your hands. Keep them firing propaganda to keep people working hard, working diligently in the factories to make sure the soldiers had all the equipment necessary in order for them to fight this war effectively. Facilitating production is going to be a huge way the government is going to be involved in the economy. But there's some other things that the government's going to do in order to make sure this war is fought effectively. Inflation will come about in 1942 due to the fact that there will be basically full employment and also a decrease in consumer goods. So because of that, there's going to be another... Uh, government administration, the OPA, this is the Office of Price Administration, that's going to put rising prices under control through regulations. Um, again, rationing is going to help basically push down consumer goods. Let's just said meat, butter, flour, sugar. And then we'll see some other things going on in the same regard. The National War Labor Board is going to be designated in order to try to facilitate labor disputes during the war and other types of things. In order to help with the inflation, they're going to put wage ceilings on. So basically that's a limit to the amount of wage increase that will occur. During the war, there is there are not many strikes, all right, because of the fact that really work is going to be so necessary in order to fight the war. Um, because of that, we don't see much disruption of labor. However, there are still some people that want to fight for better worker rights. They don't want something like a wage ceiling, which they feel could hurt them. So. Because of that, the government will go one step further in order to make sure that labor is on the same page and there's not going to be any disruption. That comes with the smith Connolly Anti-Strike Act, and this does a couple of things. Number one, it gives government the power to operate any industry that's tied up with labor disputes. So actually, the government will basically take over the coal mine industry and the railroad industry for a period of time when they were having labor disputes and basically saying, we don't have time for this. And then the other thing that it will do is it will make strikes um, illegal. Okay, And 
this is done basically to minimize labor issues that could impact the production necessary for the war to be fought. So this is a huge role that we're seeing the government play in the economy, but one that they're going to see as being absolutely necessary in order to fight this war effectively. This, by the way, is supposed to show that connection between our farmers and our soldiers. Um, and again, trying everyone kind of on the same page here and, and everyone playing for the same team. And here, by the way, is supposed to look at Smith Connolly and the idea here of really uh, limiting strikes um, during the wartime. When we talk about people impacted by the war, there are many. But women are a big part of this, and the reason why has a lot to do with their contributions uh, to the labor effort. In total, about 15 million U.S. men will serve in the war, and about 200,000 women will serve in the war. And, by the way, those women, that's non-combat roles, so support roles, service roles, administrative type roles, etc. Some key industries will be exempt from having to serve, but 15 million is a lot, so you need people to replace the workers. And one of the big contributions we see is from women. And about 6 million women will work during World War II in various capacities, but largely replacing the labor lost by men as they enter into the war. The government's going to try to help out by setting up daycares for kids to be at while mom goes to work and does her part to contribute to the wartime victory. When we talk about women and the strides that they are able to achieve as far as working during World War II, it is significant and important to note. That being said, mostly when we think about it, it is not going to be very well sustained after. And the reason why is that most women will leave their jobs after the war is over, either because men return home and now want their job back, or to go back to more traditional uh, duties of women and things like that. After the war, what we're going to see is the move to suburbia and the move to kind of mass domestic love, basically, in in the suburbs and stuff like that. So um, even though World War II is important, we don't see those jobs sustained. But a huge contribution women play in fulfilling a lot of the jobs lost by men as they go to fight. Woman, by the way, working in a munitions factory here during World War II. Here's some more women. Another group I want to talk about specifically are blacks and their experience throughout the wartime. Just so you know, if you recall, the South has been an area that's been incredibly underdeveloped and incredibly under-industrialized. FDR will try to take the war and the increased spending and defense contracts in order to try to improve economic development in the South, including giving the South a disproportionate number of defense contracts. Um, it will definitely help the South improve a little bit industrially. It will never be at pace with the North and other areas of the country, but at least it is something. However, I won't want to more so focus on the experiences of Blacks who will take this opportunity to move out of the South and move into the northern cities and cities and states out in the western part of the country. And a big reason why will have to do with the fact that there are opportunities there to work in the factories. Um, what we're also going to start to see is blacks more and more living in the cities. And for really... Up to this point, blacks have been living in rural parts of the country, doing agrarian farm work and things like that. Now, they all of a sudden are going to be huge city dwellers and people that live in a city. So they become a very, very urban group. Uh, so another notable achievement there. Blacks also do serve in the military. About 1 million of our 15 million soldiers will be African Americans. And these are people that... 
are largely going to be segregated in their units. Um, a lot of times under the direction of white generals and commanders, but again, one million is a pretty substantial amount of soldiers. Probably the most significant military group of blacks during World War I are the Tuskegee Airmen. This is a specific group, um, all black airmen, who actually play a pretty significant contribution, especially in some of our European campaigns. Um, but our first total group of um, all, all black airmen, and you see them posted here, so definitely um, heroic type of status that we come into play uh, and want to be looking at. As far as working is concerned, we see a major victory for blacks with the creation of the FEPC. This is the Fair Employment Practices uh, Commission. And what this does is that this ensures that there is no discrimination in defense industries. And the idea here being that FDR needs workers. Okay, He can't have a situation where companies and factories are not hiring because the worker is black, all right? There's just no time for that because there's so many jobs to be filled. So he creates the FEPC in order to get rid of that discrimination and make sure more workers can be hired. Um, also, make sure that they have the same wages as their white counterparts. So this is definitely an achievement towards black rights that we hadn't quite seen before. Blacks will also take this time to try to stress the need for victory, and they do this through a campaign known as the double V or slogan, V meaning victory. And what this will mean is victory at home against racism, victory abroad against the dictators, against the Hitlers, against the Mussolini, you know, against Japan, stuff like that. So it's really kind of an empowering thing. And we see the civil rights movement really take steam right after World War II, basically. And a lot of that has to do with the experiences of both black soldiers and black civilians during World War II. Because so many blacks will move to other parts of the country, racism to blacks is going to expand as areas of the country that have historically not had many black residents will now have a lot. And this will include um, a pretty significant race riot occurring in Detroit. Um, so again, I, I just make this comment because although a lot of the strides are significant, it's not like racism just magically disappears. No, if anything, it expands as people in parts of the country that have really not seen blacks now do and now want to kind of retaliate against them. Here's a look at our Tuskegee Airmen, a group of black soldiers during World War II. And when we talk about the double V, are we talking about Ben Stiller in this double V? No, no. Instead, we're talking about this double victory for blacks during World War II. Victory abroad against the authoritarian rule and then victory at home against racism, um, against the unfair treatment of blacks. So really... Uh, big strides to be made here. And blacks feel like because of their contributions in the factories, because of their contributions in uh, the actual fighting, that they should be taken more seriously. Other minority groups that play a big, big role in World War II, I'll start with Latino Americans, primarily Mexican Americans, 500,000 soldiers. So once again, pretty sizable group here as well. There's also something else that's going to happen as far as labor is concerned, which is that with so many farmers and with such the need, so many farmers leaving for war, getting drafted, and then with the need for more production of food, we're going to see a program initiated known as the Bracero Program. And this brings Mexican farmers into the United States in order to farm in kind of the southwest areas. And actually, this program will exist up until about 1960, so even after the war ends. And this will be a big way in which many um, Mexicans will make their way up to the country and start residence in the United States. And again, serves a very necessary wartime need. 
Native Americans been quiet, been living on the reservations primarily. We'll see actually about 25,000 Native Americans in the armed forces. We'll also see some Native Americans, by the way, moving to some of the major cities, moving outside of the reservations in order to pursue work opportunities and things like that. The major role that's significant to look at when we talk about Native Americans is that the government in order to try to have a secret code, will use actually the Navajo language. Um, and so native Navajo will become what we refer to as code talkers as they decrypt and give out radio messages in the Navajo code. Really significant. The Navajo code is never cracked by the Germans or the Japanese. It will actually even be used a little bit in the Korean War. So this is obviously successful and really relies a lot on some of these uh, young Navajo men in order to be these code talkers. Again, similar to blacks, it's not all great. Uh, for uh, Mexican-Americans or Latino-Americans specifically, we see the Zoot Suit Riots where in the Los Angeles area, white sailors will see some young Mexican-Americans in Zoot Suits and start to attack them. Um, so obviously that's not a very good sign. But um, a lot of progress being made though. Other than obviously these extreme and bad cases. Uh, for our minority groups. And big roles that they're playing. In order to achieve victory. For the United States. And for the allied side. Some Mexican uh, farmers coming in. Through the Bracero program. These, by the way, are some of our uh, co-talkers during World War II. A group of some of our minority soldiers. And then these are U.S. sailors uh, in the Los Angeles area during the Zoot Suit Riots, literally trying to basically hunt down uh, Mexican-Americans, um, basically for nothing more than the fact that they were Mexican. Okay, before we get into the fighting, let me make a couple comments about the home front. Let's talk about the home front for the United States. World War II is definitely going to have the biggest impact on American life than any of the war before. And that probably has to do with rationing probably more than anything else. And the fact that rationing will become a requirement during World War II for Americans. World War I, it was heavily suggested and it was... Uh, encourage now you're actually going to be given coupons that you have to use when buying essential goods so that's going to ration people and limit them so uh, pretty obviously substantial that being said the impact for Americans is way way less than really anyone else as far as major countries involved in the war other countries when the war ends will be in complete economic ruin um, just be totally devastated. And the United States is actually going to go the opposite way. Income will increase for Americans. Prosperity will really mark the post-World War II period. Um, and again, a much, much different thing. Probably your other big impact that you just want to think of collectively, and it's the reason why we talk about all those organizations, is because the role of the government during World War II is massive, far bigger than anything we've seen before. Uh, throughout American history, but it's going to take that heavy role of the government to be able to fund and be able to direct this massive war effort, and it's also going to be what fixes the Great Depression. You can see here from this graph, unemployment does not reach its big lows until really World War II, so World War II does fix unemployment much more than any of the New Deal programs. The war will also cost a lot of money, about 10 times the cost of the United States' uh, participation in World War One. Um, in order to fund the war, FDR will expand the income tax um, as to who has to pay, as well as higher rates for our top income earners, but that will only pay for so much, and the majority of the war will be funded through loans and other types of debts uh, that will go on for later. But nonetheless, again, the government taking on increased spending in order to fight this massive endeavor. 
Here, by the way, is an example of a uh, ration coupon for sugar. And so if you bought sugar, you'd have to pay for it, but you'd also have to present this coupon so that um, you couldn't just buy as many as you wanted. Uh, here's another one from a store specifically about sugar ration at two pounds a month. Um, so again, different rates um, and for the different countries. And again, hopefully you're seeing this, which is the fact that the United States, although rationing, uh, sacrificed much less than other countries. Look at propaganda for World War II rationing. We see the difference at the top. There's no rationing. She's taking all the stuff. Oh my gosh. But then at the bottom, they both are rationing. They both get one. All smiles, all happiness. We're all good. I'm going to move through the fighting of the war relatively quickly. On the AP exam, we're not really going to see necessarily anything explicitly and directly tied to the fighting, but there are some significant things that happen that could be used in whatever the prompt is going to be or whatever exactly they're going to ask of you. It's also, to be honest, real awesome. Okay, the Americans fighting their best war probably ever as far as military execution, so it is worthy of kind of talking about this at least a little bit. We'll start with the East, which is that similar to Japan, sorry, similar to Germany in the early parts of the war, Japan had a lot of early successes in the Pacific and was able to expand their empire massively. You can see it here, but they took over, uh, again, parts of China, they moved into the East Indies, then they moved into all these other islands throughout the Pacific. And really, we have not seen this type of empire expansion really in world history ever this quickly, okay? Um, the Japanese military is brutal. I kind of talked about that a little bit last class. I'll bring up another one, which is going to actually involve American soldiers, which is the Bataan Death March. Um, this is when they're going to take people after uh, Bataan, and they're going to make them march a 60, 70 mile uh as it's claims, kind of death march. They do not feed them. They don't give them water. They whip them or kill them at various points in time. Really, really brutal stuff. But that is somewhat of the Japanese kind of war machine. Uh, brutal, tough, etc. U.S. commander in charge is going to be Douglas MacArthur. One of probably our better U.S. Uh, commanders or military guys, but very controversial, egotistical, kind of a crazy guy. Uh, but his accomplishments in the Pacific are noteworthy. And the U.S. changes tides, uh, probably our most famous battle of the Pacific, which is the, which is the Battle of Midway. And they're able to push the Japanese back. This is kind of that first place that Japan goes to, doesn't actually conquer. And then the strategy that MacArthur and the other Pacific commanders will employ is known as island hopping and I'm going to show you this in another map but basically what this is trying to do is to take over the islands furthest away from Japan first and then basically kind of like jump from island to island getting stronger building up troops as you go um, because the idea is the further away from Japan, the least protected those islands are. So you can start there, do those kind of quickly. And then as you get close to Japan, it's going to be harder, obviously. So um, again, this will be a very, very effective strategy. And the U.S. will be able to take back a lot of land uh, from the Japanese into uh, the later part of 1942, 1943, into 1944. So this is a successful strategy. Look here at what Japan had expanded to before the U.S. got involved. Then a little bit more here, again, how far they were able to go well out into the Pacific. This, by the way, is a look at the Bataan Death March. These are people that have been captured, American and Filipino soldiers primarily forced to embark this brutal, brutal trek. These are two American soldiers that survived the Bataan Death March. You can see how skinny they are after uh, because of lack of food, but still huge physical exhaustion, lack of water, etc. They're lucky in the sense that they survived. Many will not, showing this Japanese military cruelty. And here's Douglas MacArthur, controversial guy, uh, but, you know, successful down in the Pacific. And here we can see island hopping. We can see uh, kind of two routes being taken in order to take back all these areas. And what's going to happen is when they first start this, 
it's going to start successfully and it's going to work out relatively well. The, the problem will be as they get closer to Japan, it gets a little bloodier. Okay, it gets a little more deadly and it gets a little more intense. So something that I'll return to a little bit later on. Okay, let me take you to Europe and remind you the last time we saw um, Europe in the summer of 1941, Germany will invade the Soviet Union. Poor mistake, by the way, by Hitler. Um, this will bring the Soviet Union in on the side of the Allies. This will also, by the way, lead to uh, Hitler's biggest defeat, which will be basically as the winter comes in and his troops are not ready, as well as the defense and the fighting ability of uh, the Soviet Red Army. Um, but as Stalin is fighting against Germany in the East, he really puts a lot of hope and and desire, really, for the United States and Britain to put much more pressure on Germany from the West. Germany comes into the Soviet Union. They're full-blown. They cause a lot of destruction. They kill a lot of people. And Stalin's going to tell Churchill and FDR, hey, please, come in here, put some direct pressure on Germany from this side, kind of squeeze them. This, this will help us out. We'll be able to take care of business. At this point, 1942, U.S. and Britain say, hey, look, please give us patience, okay? We're just not quite ready in order for us to do this. And Stalin, not incredibly thrilled, but, you know, realizing, yeah, they probably aren't ready, all right? They need some more time to be able to build up. Our big commander of the U.S. forces in Europe will be Dwight D. Eisenhower, will later on actually be president of the United States, and he decides instead to kind of take an indirect route to put pressure on Germany with the hopes that by the time they finally get to putting direct pressure on Germany, they'll be much more ready. And so what they decide to do first is go to Northern Africa. Northern Africa had been taken over by Germany, come in, they're successful, and they're able to take over. From Northern Africa, they're going to launch on into Italy. And what happens in Italy is kind of peculiar. They take over Sicily very quickly, and they move on into Italy, and Mussolini basically is pushed out of office at this point, and Italy will basically surrender. So, okay, that seems pretty good. Not really, because what happens here is that Germany does not want to lose Italy. And... Even though Italy technically remains independent throughout the war, um, it had almost become like a German puppet state. So Germany was largely taking the reins there and, and had taken it kind of over. Um, so they did not want to lose Italy. So Germany will defend Italy basically almost until the end. As fighting continues in Italy, as Germany tries to hold on, the Soviets will launch a counteroffensive on the east against Germany. That's going to be counteroffensive. That's going to last for about two years, but it's going to be one that the Germans are really never going to be able to quite repulse. So it's just going to be one of those things that will be pushing, 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 pushing into Germany from the east. And then the other thing that's kind of interesting, if you want to know, Mussolini will actually be killed. Mussolini is just never quite the leader that the Italian people had basically hoped. He lost favor relatively quickly and was never really able to solve Italy's problems, nor was he ever able to bring Italy onto the world stage. Torch here. Here's Eisenhower. Great military mind. Here's a look at our fighting going on in Europe. And here we see actually Mussolini is one of those guys up on the hook, um, which will be, um, you know, kind of for everyone to see, uh, showing how kind of quickly Mussolini had fallen out of favor. Okay, let me talk about some further progress in Europe. Again, we could probably spend hours and hours talking about the fighting, but i just give you kind of the abbreviated version. Um, interesting development in late 1943 at the Tehran Conference in Iran, where the big three will meet, which is Stalin of the Soviet Union, FDR of the United States, and Churchill of Britain. 
And when they meet, Churchill and FDR reassure Stalin, we're going to open up that second front for you. Okay, say sorry, you know, it's been a little bit of time, but we're stronger, we're better now, we'll be able to go. And their planned way to do so will occur on June 6, 1944, a day that is remembered as D-Day. And this is when the U.S. and the British force, joint force, will land on the beaches of Normandy in France. And this day is brutal. This day is tough. They meet a lot of resistance by the Germans. Uh, but at the end of the day, the coordinated attack is enough where they're able to land onto the beaches here. And within about a month, they would have liberated France. So now by um, the later summer, France has been liberated. So this is all good stuff for the U.S. and the Allies. They're now ready to move on to Germany, so it's not going to happen super quick, but at the same time, they've been able to build this stuff up. It's all good, and from what it seems like, the clock of Hitler's regime, Hitler's Third Reich, is very much ticking. Show you some pictures from D-Day, but I want to show you this one first, which is from uh, the Tehran Conference, and we see FDR, we see Churchill, and we see Stalin. Um, really interesting, Churchill did not like Stalin because he was a communist. Um, FDR didn't really necessarily love him either, but FDR is always kind of that middle guy in there. Kind of much more accepting, kind of trying to tell Churchill, hey, look, I know he's not the best, but we got to make this work, you know. So, that, so he's kind of like the voice of reason throughout this. This, by the way, another look at uh, D-Day, and you can see here all the coordination that comes in here as far as uh, planes, as far as ships, and all this other kind of stuff. Here's Eisenhower preparing his men before uh, D-Day. Again, great military uh, guy. And here, by the way, if you want to look a little bit more specifically at the numbers of D-Day, you can see your aircraft numbers, your vessels, you can see the number of lives lost. You can see how many troops are deployed. Huge, huge numbers. But this is what ends up becoming necessary in order to secure uh, that foothold into France. And then from there, they're going to march into France and then onwards into Germany. Amidst all this chaos, amidst all this craziness that's going on, it's hard to imagine that there is still going to be an election. And now we're getting into the later part of 1944. It's time. And even though there's some discussion about maybe suspending, you know, elections because of all this kind of stuff, not substantiated, not going to sacrifice that. It's still time to, to get going here. The Republicans will meet and they'll decide on Thomas Dewey, uh, only 42 years old, actually governor of New York. FDR at one point was governor of New York. And the Democrats once again decide that FDR is going to be the person they're going to put up. Um, even though he is now going to be running for his fourth term, it's not going to be that unsettling for most Americans who support him. And the reason being is because he kind of already broke the seal going for the third. So because of that, it doesn't really draw that much anger issues and, and whatever else. However, at this point, FDR is in worsening health. Think about what he's had to deal with as a president. He had to deal with the Depression. Then now he's dealing with World War II. And he remember, he had polio. It's, he's getting older. By the way, the presidency, they've done studies, ages the average president double during their time, even for like an average president. So you can imagine the kind of aging that FDR must have been going through. Anyways, because of his worsening health, he... There's a little more focus put on who he's going to pick as his vice president. He chooses Harry Truman from Missouri. Um, somebody that's not incredibly controversial, but has decent experience. Okay, well, you know, this is what you oftentimes do. You pick someone that's not too controversial. Similar to 1940, FDR will campaign some, mostly to kind of ease people's fears about him being in bad health. But he's very busy. All right, he's, he's obviously, you know, a fight in a war here. He didn't really have time to go on the campaign trail. Doesn't seem to matter. FDR does achieve victory in 1944. Big electoral college victory, as he typically has done. And pretty decent popular vote victory here also. Um, with this happening, FDR now becomes our first president to have four terms in office. 
And why do people pick him in 1944? The need for experience. And also, it seems like war is coming closer to an end. There's more of a realization by the American people. We need somebody that can make sure world peace will be achieved. We, we need that to kind of happen so we can get this together. Here, here we kind of see that through this uh, cartoon um, of... Uh, or at least not really cartoon, kind of cartoon campaign poster, FDR, Uncle Sam, stay and finish the job. And that's absolutely going to be a major feeling out of this. Register and vote Democratic. Here we see Roosevelt. Here we see Truman. And here we see our electoral map. Again, very resounding victory as far as the Electoral College is concerned. Popular vote, pretty overwhelming as well. Okay, let's talk about where victory is achieved in Europe and how that kind of happens. As we get into late 1944, early 1945, the Soviets who have been pushing in on the east are now in the eastern part of Germany. U.S., Britain on the western part of Germany. So now all of a sudden, Germany is being surrounded and they are being attacked from both sides. Hitler's going to make one last kind of major effort on the west in the Battle of the Bulge and... Some success, but it will be successfully halted. Um, and so at this point in time, as we get into kind of the first few months of 1945, um, it seems like the days are really, really numbered at this point. However, before that occurs, something pretty sad happens, pretty unexpected. April 12th, FDR will die. So now Truman is the president. So... You know, again, that wasn't exactly what people were anticipating, but they knew his health was declining. Um, again, by April 1945, they are in Germany, closing in on the capital. On April 30th, Hitler will commit suicide. And on May 7th, Germany will officially surrender, thus marking the end of the war in Europe. And this is what we refer to as VE Day, Victory in Europe Day. Uh, May 7th. So again, big deal. Obviously a lot of excitement. The major enemy has been defeated in Hitler and Germany. Mussolini gone as well. This is big, big, big um, for the U.S., for Britain, and of course for the Soviet Union as well. One of the things we don't really talk about too much because it's more world history topic is that as the U.S., comes in, they do help liberate the concentration camps. Really, it's the Soviet troops, though, that do. And unfortunately, the U.S. will always draw a little bit of criticism for not doing more to help um, Jewish people in World War II or in, in before World War II as the U.S. cut off immigration um, in the late 1930s. So only a handful of Jews were actually able to come into the States. Here's some look at an American soldier outside um, a concentration camp. And here, by the way, are the German uh, commanders signing a surrender. And this is an unconditional surrender. Uh, they get nothing from this, but they do fully surrender. And VE Day means partying in the streets for the Allied countries as they are so excited that now they've been able to achieve victory. Parades, other things, singing, dancing, so, such a great time. However, is it really that great? And the answer is no. And that is because in the East, fighting is still going on. And this is fighting, by the way, that the U.S. is primarily doing by themselves. The U.S. are achieving victories. There's no question about it. Big victories in some islands very close to Japan, Okinawa, Iwo Jima. This, by the way, very famous photo coming out of the Battle of Iwo Jima. Our American soldiers hoisting the American flag. With that being said, many U.S. lives are being lost in this campaign against the Japanese. The other thing is that although the United States is winning, the Japanese refuse to surrender and basically seem hell-bent on continuing to fight till the very, very end, no matter how destroyed they get. They also cause additional damage through their kamikaze suicide plane missions. So these are going after U.S. ships and U.S. aircraft carriers and things like that. So again, it's like you think that you've achieved this great victory over 
Germany and you do, but you're still fighting on the east. So this is obviously a huge headache. Um, the next plan was to invade the mainland of Japan. And that was kind of, okay, I think this is what we're going to do next. However, as they do the estimates of what that's going to look like, it's going to be a whole lot more U.S. lives that are going to be lost. Um, when they're doing these type of things for the military, there's people that assess that type of stuff. Early low estimates said at least 30,000 American lives. Other estimates said another 200,000 just from this invasion. So the question for the United States is kind of like, what do we do here? Okay, we've been fighting for long enough. You know, how can this still be continuing on? Ugh. Let me show you some images from this uh, U.S. fighting Okinawa. This, by the way, is a kamikaze mission. These are kids that are actually bidding best wishes to this kamikaze. Um, again, that's horrifying. These are young kids that are basically being indoctrinated in this militaristic attitude that had overtaken Japan. Destruction from the kamikaze, okay, and again, this is what the Japanese were doing. In the early part of the war, the United States had taken on a very, very secret mission known as the Manhattan Project. A lot of this was motivated from exiled German scientists, Albert Einstein playing a huge role, and kind of getting the ear of FDR and telling FDR, you need to create an atomic bomb. Okay, and the reason why he suggests this is because he thought that Germany was going to create one as well and would use it against the United States. So the United States needed to be proactive into getting this taken care of. The name given to the creation of the atomic bomb is known as the Manhattan Project. And a few things I want to kind of tell you about for this. This is done in complete secrecy. And here, by the way, is the main gate. It's in Los Alamos, New Mexico done so because it's not going to draw much attention and there's a lot of people that contribute but they don't really even know necessarily the extent of what they're contributing to other than the real kind of main people that work on the atomic bomb that live in Los Alamos during this time they don't talk to anyone about what's going on or happening because the idea here is that what they're creating is just so revolutionary and you would never want the enemy or even the general public to know exactly what goes on. In the summer of 1945, they test it in the middle of the desert in Trinity, New Mexico. And it's more power, more destructive than anything they ever imagined. It's also during the summer of 1945 in July that the Potsdam Conference will take place with the Big Three they're going to change a little bit. Obviously, FDR dead, so now it's Truman. Um, in the middle of the conference, a new British prime minister will take over for uh, Churchill. But at the Potsdam conference, they tell very specifically to the Japanese, you need to surrender. Okay, You need to surrender unconditionally, or there's going to be serious problems. Japan unfazed at this point the united states has been telling them for a long time that they need to surrender so what's changed now well i'm going to show you this by the way a look at the project gate of los alamos again not open to the general public only for people working on the project here by the way is the big three at the beginning of potsdam you see churchill you see truman in the middle and then you see stalin over here on the right and then by the time potsdam ends in a few weeks this is going to be our new big three. So Truman you see in the middle, and then you see Stalin, and then this is Clement Attlee, who will actually become the new Prime Minister of Britain in 1945. And signs like this hang around uh, Los Alamos. Loose talk helps our enemy, so let's keep our trap shut. What you see here, what you do here, what you hear here, when you leave here, let it stay here big message here because if anyone knew what was going on it could be incredibly dangerous so war ends in japan suddenly and in fairly tragically and let me just give you kind of the timeline here august 6 1945 
the U.S. will drop one atomic bomb on the Japanese city of Hiroshima. Relatively big city, industrial city, factories, people, and basically 180,000 casualties out of this. All right, including about 70,000 that basically are just killed instantaneously. It's hard for us to even know the figures because the power of this basically leads many bodies and others to never even be found. Um, there's also people that die not immediately, but later on from radiation poisoning and other burns and stuff like that. This is brutal. Still, though, if you can believe this, no Japanese surrender. U.S. decides, okay, what's going on? August 8th, the Soviet Union invades Japan. And this is more a Cold War thing, but this has a lot to do with the growing tension and distrust between the U.S. and the Soviet Union. Basically, the Soviet Union wanting to have a little bit more say in the post-war discussions felt they could do so if they were res if they were at least somewhat responsible for taking over Japan. And the United States is going to want none of that. August 9th, 1945, they're going to drop another atomic bomb on the city of Nagasaki, and over 110,000 casualties happen there. Finally, after all this carnage in such a short period of time, the Japanese do officially surrender uh, on the basis that the emperor is able to maintain and be the emperor. The United States says, whatever, it's not t totally unconditional, pretty close. And then we will have officially the end of World War II with VJ Day victory in Japan Day. So again, a tough way for this thing to end. But what the United States felt was the absolute necessity in order to end the war. See here are looks at Hiroshima and then Nagasaki. The destruction brought on by the atomic bombs. Some more here. Again, just complete loss of buildings. It looks like a just a forsaken place. Here are some of our massive burn marks that come about from exposure. And here are bodies that are burned and just totally incinerated. I want to finish off by talking just briefly about the effects of World War II, which is that for the United States, we're going to see about a million U.S. casualties, including about 400,000 deaths. Now, that sounds bad, and I'm not discrediting that. That is bad. But medical improvements in World War II meant less people died from wounds. If you go back to the Civil War, if you remember, a lot of people died because of bad medicine, basically, and amputating limbs that didn't need to be amputated, or when they amputated, they didn't cut off the blood, so people bled to death. It was a total nightmare. But now we're going to see much better medical improvements, so more people that are hurt are actually able to recover and survive successfully, so that's good. But still, 400,000 is a really, really high number. Um, that being said, for other countries, like the Soviet Union, for example, who will suffer from 25 million deaths, the 400,000 suffered by the United States really do not seem like that much. World War II is also significant because the vast majority of deaths are civilians. About two-thirds are civilian deaths. Uh, for the United States, by the way, very few civilians actually die because no bombing really takes place on U.S. soil other than Pearl Harbor. But for people living in Britain, constantly being raided by the Germans, a lot of civilians die. There's bombings that occur in Berlin and other German cities, a lot of civilians die. Bombings that occur throughout Japan, including the atomic bombs, this is all very serious stuff. The world will be destroyed, right? Because of what I just said, right? The bombings and things, uh, the amount of people, the population that have died. Uh, but for the U.S., the U.S. comes out of this World War II not just as a military winner, but also as a winner through the post-war prosperity that will follow the World War II period. Um, we'll also see the United States in probably its best fighting that has ever occurred up to this point militarily, and a new wave of generals, people like Eisenhower, people like MacArthur, even though kind of crazy, still a very, very good military general. The dictators will also be overthrown, other than Stalin. 
Um, and the future of the world definitely in question now after World War II, but the idea here that we need to get rid of the fascist elements and we need to try to return to uh, what the people want and make sure that we don't have a repeat of World War I where people feel desperate and other stuff like that. So again, this war is monumental, not only for the United States, but for all of the world. This is a graph that shows the percentage of a various country's population that died in World War II. For the United States, it's it's relatively low, even though it's over 400,000 deaths. But look at Belarus, for example. About 25% of the entire population will die in World War II. Poland, about 20. These are, these are staggering numbers. This, by the way, is a really interesting one, and I encourage you to look at this a little more carefully, but you can see here a few things. Military deaths, civilian deaths, total deaths, and then the total deaths as a part of the population. So look at Latvia, for example. Only suffers really civilian deaths, and it seems like a low number, but that was actually almost 12% of their entire population that died. Poland, obviously huge. Soviet Union, big. Germany doesn't do very well, but most of those deaths are military um, look at Lithuania, for example, tough stuff. And you can see here, if we add up the civilians, both allied and access, almost about two thirds. Here's some of our European destruction. Um, so again, this isn't from the atomic bomb. This is just from regular bombings and raidings and the, and the tribulation of war. And here we see another one here, by the way, and this is just complete desecration. Versus when we talk about the United States, we're talking about the post-war prosperity boom time that will occur. So a very different experience. Okay, I know a little bit longer, but World War II is so exciting. We have now finished and completed really the content that we need to cover before the exam. So remember that spring break is next week and it's going to be through Tuesday, April 14th. So we'll have school on Wednesday, April 15th. Um... Tomorrow is when College Board is going to release some more specific information on the AP exam. So what I'd like to do, because I don't have obviously that information now, but we're going to by Friday, is I'd love to have a Google Meet during G period at 125 tomorrow. I'll send out the information. Technically, because it's outside of school hours, you do not need to attend, but I'd like you to be there. Okay, again, I'm going to be just giving out some helpful information. I won't keep you very long, just a few minutes maybe 10, 15 minutes, depending on what they say, and we'll take some questions. The other thing that I'm going to do is not only give you the information from them, but we need to talk about what work I need you to do over Easter break. If you look at your original calendar, what I had you planned to do over Easter break was pretty much a lot, right? But it had a lot to do with stuff from the Cold War and civil rights movement and stuff. Well, I, we're going to kind of pause on that right now. Because even though I think that's a super important part of American history, because of the fact that we don't have the AP exam, that's not going to be on the AP exam. I don't really want to start it before the exam. I don't think that'd be very responsible. So based on what they say tomorrow, I'm going to have a better indication of what I'd like you to do over Easter break. It will definitely be less than what I originally had, but we're going to practice. And really from here on out until whenever the AP exam is going to be, and we actually don't know the dates right now at this point, it's time to get ready, all right? And it's time to really refresh what we talked about going back to August about the colonies and about all that kind of stuff. So again, I want you to pass. AP decided not to cancel the, call, the, the test, even though there's so much crazy stuff going on. So let's take advantage of that. Thanks so much for everything. I appreciate it. Post in the chat if you got some questions. I'll have a thread in the chat as well for you. And... Talk to you soon.